All right, hey everybody, welcome back. Tonight we're gonna to talk about wine barrels and aging wine. So lots of fun stuff tonight. So for this lecture tonight, we're gonna to talk about um, the impact of the barrel on the wine. A little bit of history about wine barrels, a little bit of anatomy, and also a breakdown of how oak really benefits wine. We're also going to talk about, um, in this section, what happens to wine as it ages, what happens in the barrel, and what happens in the bottle. And also, we're going to talk about what determines how a wine can age well, or ageability. What are the components that make wines able to age for a long time? So, we're going to start off with history. So, wine barrels were created more for transport and storage, more than anything else at the time. They did not discover that there were beneficial flavors and aromas that were imparted until down the road. Um, we don't really have a lot of, um, you know, archaeological evidence of barrels because they're made out of wood and they decompose. Um, that's why we see a lot more of like the amphorae, which are these clay um, kind of figures here on the side. So the very first evidence was in Mesopotamia and it was made of palm tree wood. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of like a little fun background there. So over time, as people started to notice that the wine that came from the oak was pretty good, that's when they started to really adopt it and recognize that it helped shape the quality of the wine. But really, this is how wine was sold. It was sold by the barrel or by an amphorae. There wasn't really much, um, you know, glass bottles happening. A lot of it was, was in bulk at the time. So why, why are we still using oak to this day, like specifically and not like cedar or other types of wood? Well, oak is really dense and heavy. If you had a childhood like mine of stacking wood, you know that oak is really dense, it's really heavy, and it burns really hot. So that's why it's great for a wood fireplace and for heating your home. Um, the other wonderful thing about it is it doesn't rot when in contact with moisture and it really flexes nicely when the heat is applied and because the texture is so dense it doesn't allow for liquid leaking but it does allow for some oxygen to pass through it also adds flavor tannin and texture to the wine and those barrels can last for many many years if they're taken care of and they can be reused and repurposed so it really has just worked out it's something that we've been doing for centuries and we, we still continue to do. So it's a very fascinating um, subject. So as far as oak barrels go, there are different types of oak. Um, there is French, American, and Hungarian are the three main ones. And each of these toasts come in different, each of these barrels come in different toasting levels. So there's light, medium, medium plus, heavy. There can be um, heavy plus sometimes, and this all affects the flavors and aromas that are in that wood. Um, there are new types of oak, or sorry, new types of wood that are coming into fashion for wine, and that's um, cherry, walnut, chestnut, acacia. These are new types of wood that we're finding. Um, there might be some barrel options available, but I'm seeing a lot of oak chips, or sorry, wood chips. It's hard to remove oak from it. <laughs> wood chips um, available for adding flavors and aromas to wine. So oak though in general gives more of like tannin, vanilla, tea, and tobacco-like characteristics. We also have a picture here that kind of goes over the anatomy of a barrel. So the ends, either end of a barrel, this flat piece is called the head. Then we have um, the chime, which is kind of the circle around. Oh. Then we also have um, what's called the hoops. And the hoops are these metal uh, pieces that go around and just kind of reinforce the shape of the barrel and keep it stable. Then individual pieces of oak that run up and down the barrel here, those are called the staves. Then we have the bilge, which is the widest part of the barrel, so like the belly of the barrel. And within that bilge is where you'll find the bunghole and the the little silicone piece we put in is called the bung. So the bung and the bunghole. And yes, those are very, very um, honestly technical terms for the barrel. So as funny as it sounds, that is what it's called. So it's a little fun trivia for you 
if you ever go on a wine tour or go tasting with friends, you are more than welcome to share that little fun fact with them. So do something fun. Okay, so how does oak help wine? There's three major parts to this. So evaporation and oxygenation. So as wine ages, it evaporates and it gets micro oxygenation. This helps to concentrate the flavors and aromas and also it'll help soften some of the tannins in the wine. It imparts new flavors and aromas. So depending on the toast and the type of oak that you're using or type of wood, it leaches flavors into the wine that can be very positive. It also imparts tannins. So the lignin, lignin structures of the wood um, will impart tannins into the wine. These tannins act as um, protective agents from oxidation and reduction, um, but they also help give the wine structure. So just like tannins come from the skins and seeds of red wines, um, the oak also has a part to play in imparting tannins too. So for evaporation and oxygenation, so like we said, over time, the wine evaporates. So there's very, very small pores in the barrel. And it's just general osmosis, uh, evaporation from you know higher concentration to low. What we call that in the industry is the angel's chair, which is kind of fun. Um, so during this, the flavors of a wine start to change. Um, it starts to develop more of a nutty component, and this can be taken very like lightly. It can be like a nice nuttiness. This can also come from the flavor of just the oak, the oak um, toast. But it can start to develop these nutty flavors. You'll find this a lot in oxidized wines. So wines that have too much oxygen, you'll get a plethora of these nutty characters, um, and also kind of a brown fruit. So this can happen in bottle aging too. Then we have micro oxygenation, which the oxygen helps to smooth out the tannins, prevent any reductive aromas, and helps with the color stability of the wine. So you want a little bit of oxygen, not too much. So the second part is imparting new flavors and aromas. So we said this really depends on the oak itself. So the if what the type of oak, if it's French or American or Hungarian, and if it's a light, medium, or heavy toast, also where the oak was grown. Um, the oak, just like the grapes, are highly influenced by climate and soil. So fun fact. So that really just makes a big difference in the flavors that we're getting. So an interesting thing is the cooler the climate, the finer the grain, and the less oxygen contact and the more subtle, elegant oak influence in the wine. So we'll see in a, in a chart in a couple of slides that's very typical of French oak um, types. So different flavors that can be imparted. We talk about oak, We're talking about, you know, cinnamon, allspice, vanilla, clove. These are the aromas that start to come out through aging in the bottle. So tertiary aromas that came from the oak. So all these spices are very typical of oak aging. So here's a nice little chart. We've seen this before in another lecture of the different types of oak flavors and um, that you can get from different types of toasts, depending on American, French, or Hungarian. Um, interestingly enough, for a white wine barrel, we don't normally toast those barrels. They're actually treated with steam to bend the staves in place, so that way it's a much more subtle um, oak, and it's not a charred flavor that could overpower the you know, the lightness and the, the delicacy of white wines. So fun fact there, those are treated with steam. So here we have a little chart comparing American oak to French oak. American oak uh, tends to grow faster, so that means it has a wider grain. With that wider grain, the pores are larger and you have more of an oxygen transfer than you would for French oak. So it's a wider grain, more oxidation than French oak. French oak is a finer grain and less oxidation. So remember, this is oxidation on a much smaller scale than we talk about with like wine spoilage. That's a whole nother level of oxidation. For American oak, it apparently gives less tannins, but it has more of the lactones, which are the compounds that contribute to the flavors of like vanilla, caramel, and baking spices. 
So when I tell people like the my my um take on the difference between American and French oak, American oak is very vanilla. It'll always be very vanilla uh forward almost like think about like America, think about like Coca-Cola, you know. Um very like vanilla caramel baking spices. For French oak, I always like to say cigar box or like a, a cedar um, chest if you ever grew up with one of those in your house much more of like um kind of like those other spices if that kind of makes sense um dark chocolate nutmeg allspice and again it depends on the toast but those are kind of some of the major differences so it just depends just depends what you want to do so number three, uh, the, the benefits of using oak is it imparts tannins. So along with all these lovely flavors and aromas and micro oxygenation, we get tannins. So like we said, tannins come from oak, but they also came from the grape itself. So depending on your fermentation, if it's a red wine, you know, and the variety that you had, you, there's already a level of tannin in the wine. By, new, by using new oak, you can help impart more tannin to make even bolder wines. So the oak tannin that comes from the barrels um, helps to preserve wine and give it additional mouthfeel and texture. So tannins are the drying sensation in your mouth when you are drinking wine. And what we have here, this very complex picture, don't worry, you don't have to memorize this. So th uh, this is what you know a singular t uh, monomer of tannin looks like. These are multiple connecting together what you're tasting in your wine. So that's when it kind of creates chains and um, binds together. Wonderful. So in addition to that, with the tannin, it adds texture to your wine. So they kind of go hand in hand, tannin and texture. Um, tannins can also provide astringency, which helps contribute to texture and mouthfeel. Astringency is really just kind of like that... Um, mouth puckering sensation we talk about astringency in kind of like the wide world of things if you use like skincare products that are, uh, that are an astringent it literally like sucks your pores really really tight and pulls all of the gunk that was in them so an astringent is something that literally shrinks your pores so it does that same thing but on your tongue it's a very very like tightening sensation okay so ideally, you're going to want tannins that provide a full and round texture in your mouth. You don't want any angular or green or unripe tannins. So that's kind of the goal. They talk A lot of writings talk about you want to prevent a donut texture in your mouth. And that has nothing to do with like sweetness or sweets or donuts. It's really just the shape. So if, if the tannins don't cover your whole palate nicely and uniformly, if there's like spaces missing or if it's, you know, hitting certain spots too hard, then that would be um, not a positive thing. So think about texture. Adds texture. Okay. So we do, we're going to move into um, kind of wine aging and decisions that are made around wine aging and um, different styles that involve aging. So one of these is surly aging. And this is leaving the wine on the lees, which if you don't remember what that is, it's the inactive yeast and bacteria left over from fermentation. Um, so this is long after the fermentation is finished. You're leaving it on the sediment. This can help give the wine a creamy taste, better mouthfeel, and a yeasty aroma. So yeasty aroma like sourdough and toffee and creme brulee and nuts. So these are the tertiary aromas, the aromas that would occur from aging as a result of the surly practice. Um, then we also have Madeirizing. Um, and this is a very interesting topic. It's when you expose wine to heat and you oxidize it to produce caramel and other flavors. And that's got a really interesting he history. So Madeira is actually an island. Um, this type of wine is very, very old. It dates back to the age of exploration at the end of the 15th century. It was, at the time, very standard to have shipments heading to the New World or West Indies. Wine was fortified to prevent it from spoiling on the ship, 
But what we didn't know when we were sending the wine out, that it was exposed to extreme heat and movement in the travels on the ship. They didn't have AC on the ships. It wasn't a thing. Um, so it really just transformed the flavor of the wine. So the only reason that these wine producers discovered what was happening is, is when a wine from an unsold shipment came back to them. And they tasted it and they're like, what the heck? This is not what we sent out. What happened? So they figured it out. Um, it still sold and it was still used and popular, so it has survived just the test of time. You can buy this wine at Total Wine. Madeira is still made to this day and still purchased around the world. Um, there's cheaper versions available now that, um, have salt and pepper in them because they're highly used for cooking. Lots of wonderful flavors for cooking. It's seen in all sorts of styles dry sweet or as an aperitif uh, but the interesting thing is is because of its competition Madeira wine can literally last for decades even after being opened so it's already seen this is a wine that's seen all sorts of hell right it's been fortified it's been cooked it's been oxidized so it's really just at the point of there's nothing else that could possibly go wrong so it's gonna lasts forever and ever so it's definitely something different i'd recommend trying it because it's just very bizarre but it has a lot of fun uh, and important history to it so you never know you might really like it okay so with that being said we're going to take a little segue into barrel care and maintenance uh, barrels can last a long time as if they're taken care of properly if they're not, it's a real pain to bring them back up to speed. Excuse me. Um, so what happens if barrels are left empty for an extended period of time, they start to dry out. So all the moisture just kind of wicks out of the barrel and they no longer hold a seal. So barrels actually hold a liquid tight seal on their own. We don't there isn't a paste on the inside of the barrel or anything like that. It is strictly how it was formed and how it was um, bound together. So if it's left empty for too long, it starts to dry. And these staves, these pieces of wood that go across the barrel like this, across the belly, they start to shrink. And then the spaces between the staves are no longer airtight or uh, liquid tight. So, you can, you can see in this picture, well, we're filling the seemingly brand new barrel with water, and it's leaking the water all over the place. So, this is a huge bummer. This should not have happened. What will happen, though, is once you, once you fill it with water as it's leaking, the wood will swell up again as it's soaking up that water, and it will form a seal again. It's not great. You definitely want to... Do this with water before you do it with wine because you lose a bunch of wine it's going to be a very sad day um, another thing is if your barrels are stored outside they're very prone to these little bugs that love eating the wood these wood boring beetles they drill tiny little holes into the barrel and then the wine will come spewing out so it'll create these little leaks you can fix them with some bamboo bamboo skewers um, but overall, that's kind of the general care and maintenance. Some barrel companies do sell a paste to help seal up leaks. Um, but for the most part, what you see with the brand new barrel, as long as it was taken care of and functioning properly, um, it seals all by itself. So, interesting thing for you. Okay. So, now we're going to move into the changes that we see in wine in the bottle as it ages. So th we talk about this more in the wine components class, but there are primary, secondary, and tertiary aromas in wine. Primary comes from the grape itself. So these are aromas and flavors that come from it being a Barbera versus a Petit Syrah. It's just the grape. So it's just the genetics of the grape. This is what flavors come from that. And then also like from the terroir, the in the vineyard treatments. So that all comes from the grape itself when you harvest it that's what's set in front of you secondary aromas come from fermentation so any any type of yeast that we added that that um, brought out certain characters because that was the yeast that we chose 
Um, fermentation decisions. Do we leave it on the skins? Do we press it right away? Do we do a carbonic maceration, whole cluster fermentation, stuff like that? Those are secondary aromas. So aromas that came from the winemaker decisions. Tertiary aromas are from aging. And in a Psalms world, this really means bottle aging specifically. So now we're kind of headed into that section here. So tertiary aromas, if you were confused, that's what tertiary aromas are. So these are aromas that aren't going to develop until the wine ages and they start to become more expressed. So for tertiary aromas and aging wine, we're going to see changes in color, flavor, and textures. Just a little disclaimer, not all wines are meant to be aged and aging wine is not a cure-all for fixing wine that's out of balance. If wine's out of balance, it's just out of balance. So one of the big things that we're going to see in aged wines is changes in color. So the wine, the color of a wine is most stable um, with tannin and oxygen integration from the barrels. But as it ages, young red wines start off much more purple, purpley and dark. Then as they age, they start to turn more red and then eventually start to turn kind of orangish and brown. For white wines, the younger they are, the more pale they are. Then as they age, they turn more yellow, and then finally they result to brown as well. So that's just a really good way to tell for aging in a wine glass. If you're doing a wine tasting, you know, tilt your glass, see if it has purple hues or red hues um, or brown hues, and then you can really tell what's going on. Okay, also... For changes in aromas, what we're going to see as a wine starts to age is you lose those primary aromas, so those fruity aromas that came from the grape itself. Those will start to diminish, and then the tertiary aromas will start to come out. So flavors like mushroom and stone, you know. Um, and this isn't always what's desired, depending on the style of wine and the winemaker's goals. Some wines are designed to be drank young, and some wines are designed to age and some people just have a preference. Some people prefer aged wines or, you know, whatever. So just keep that in mind. But that's what happens to aromas as it ages. You'll see changes in texture as a wine ages too. So tannins start to diminish as wines age. And it's not that those tannins are suddenly poof, gone in a bottle as they're aging. What's happening is that tannins start to polymerize. And as they bind together... How your saliva in your mouth interacts with them is completely different. So as all those tannins are coming together to form these complex chains, your saliva can no longer dissolve it. So you aren't getting the reaction that you would from a young wine when they're all in single segments still. So um, it becomes a lot smoother as a wine starts to age. So that's why there's such a you know love for aged wines is because they can be so smooth. So, grippiness, chewy, silky, and polished can be very common positive tannin descriptors. Negative descriptors for tannin are going to be like green, so that means like unripe, astringent. Um, you know, those are going to be very negative descriptors for tannin and texture in a wine. So, just for some fun things there. Okay, next we're going to talk about. What determines if a wine can age? There's four traits that can determine whether or not a wine can age. So you might have seen, you know, you might have heard people talk about a Bordeaux from 1982 that they opened up in their cellar. Or, you know, oh, they had a, a Sauterne, a sweet white wine, you know, back from oh, 2002 that they just opened and, and they were still delicious. And it can be confusing because you're like, well, how can a wine that has aged for that long you know, especially for the Sauter, especially a white wine, how can that age? Like, how is that possible? Well, there's four traits. It's sugar, alcohol, acid, and tannin. So if a wine has, you know, one or more of these components in a very high range, that helps to determine if it can age or not. So we'll start with sugar. So wines that are sweet tend to age longer. So we're talking about 10 to 20% residual sugar. We're talking about, like, dessert wines. They're sweet, sweet wines. 
So sugar is a natural preservative. So this is why jams, preserves, and honey last a very long time. So examples of wines that fit in this profile would be Sauternes, Ports, um, Tokay, Tokay, excuse me, a German, Alsatian, Rieslings, the sweet ones. These will age anywhere between 15 to 20 years as long as they're kept in, you know, cellar temperature, proper conditions, and all that fun stuff. And as you can tell, this is an aged white wine because look how yellow that is. So very common and to be expected for these wines. Um, but yes, this is one of the things that help preserve a wine and age it. It's the sugar content. Next, we have alcohol. As we know from our fermentation lecture, anything above 16% becomes very hard for spoilage microbes to live in that. And it also works as a preservative. So fortifying a wine is a very ancient and very good way to preserve it. So for fortified wines, we're talking, these are wines that are typically between 17 to 20%. And, you know, they just age for a very long time. So port, sherry, Madeira, vermouth, these are all wines that are going to last for a long time. Okay, the next component that really helps preserve a wine is the pH. We talked about this in class before. Of course, it's the overall measure of the acid in wine determines stability, but it also prevents harmful organisms from growing and spoiling the wine. It also determines the effectiveness of sulfur dioxide in wine, but this, just like tannin, will slowly deplete in a wine over time. So for a red, pH of 3.6 and below is really ideal, and for a white, 3.2 and below is ideal for that. So, and again, just depends on the style of wine. I said sparkling it can be even lower, 2.9, and so on. So then we have tannins. So as we read from our tannin slide, it's it can help preserve the wine and give it texture and these lovely flavors um, and mouthfeel. So these are specifically coming from the oak, the berry skins, the seeds, and the stems. So like I said, tannins will slowly dissipate over time, smoothing out the texture and becoming less astringent. However, if we had a wine with no tannins, it would lack texture and it would just be very sad. It'd be like a book that doesn't have an ending or any um, plot to it, basically. So tannin is really the backbone of wine along with acid. So then we have a little food for thought here. Does white wine have tannin? If you take in the wine components class, we, we discussed this. We discussed that... No, white wine does not have tannin, but it does have astringency, which are compounds related to tannins, of course, but this is because, long answer short, we don't use the skins or stems in a white wine fermentation, and if it's made in a stainless steel tank, especially no tannins, um, if it was a white wine that was aged in oak, that could be a little bit of a different story. But in general, we talk about structure in wine, we talk about astringency, and not tannin. Very subtle, subtle difference there. All right, and that brings us to our last slide, which I have a lot of references and fun things for you guys. If you are fascinated with wine barrels and want to see how they're made, definitely check out this link from YouTube. It's just like a video showing you a cooperage and how they make the barrels. So the char and the fires and bending the wood and putting it together. It's a very fascinating process. So definitely check that out. So that is all for today, folks. I hope you learned something new, and I will see you guys next time.